Hi everyone, so in this video we are going to make a revision mind map on the topic changing places for AQA A-level geography. Hopefully you'll find it really useful. Our aim is to put all the information onto one sheet of paper, so we're really going to condense the kind of key information. If you have an A3 piece of paper to write along as we go, that'd be fantastic. Just so you know, I've also got in front of me when I'm doing this, the specification, and that's a really useful thing to have when you're revising. It means that you can check off everything that you've done so you're not going to miss anything. So what we're going to start with, for the first part of changing places, we're going to talk about the nature and importance of places, and then we are going to kind of define place and see why it is important in human life. So if we first of all, if we define the concept of place, so place can be summarised as location plus meaning. So here, location is the physical location where it can be plotted on a map or it can be described using latitude and longitude. And meaning is the social construction. So it's what the place means to a person. Now this gets us on to another key term, which is the idea of sense of place. So sense of place is the emotional meanings a place has to people. Therefore, it is subjective. It connects individuals or a group of people to a location. So for example, you might have a sense of place or an attachment to the school that you go to because you formed a lot of friendships there and therefore you have an emotional connection to it. Now, when we talk about the importance of place to human life, there's many reasons why places are important for people. Often people feel connections to places. It might be because people live in a place or it relates to a certain aspect of their life. This connection also helps people to form an identity and this identity is important to human life. It can help you have a feeling of belonging and belonging is the idea that you feel like you are part of that place. So for example, you can look at this on different scales as well. So someone might have a feeling of belonging to a country. This might be that you are important. So for example, with the World Cup in football, it could be that you are proud that you live in England because you are supporting England and that's your kind of connection to that place. It helps to form your identity. Or it could be on a much smaller scale as well. So it could be that you are connected to the local place that you live and therefore you have a sense of belonging or a sense of identity. You can also have a sense of identity with places you haven't visited and we're going to talk about that when we talk about connections to places and particular media places. Okay, so that part pretty much covers the concept of place and the importance of place in human life and experiences. Now what we're going to have a look at is the idea of insiders and outsiders perspective on place. So an insider is someone who feels familiar with place. They may live in the place or they may share cultural values. For example, they might share the same religion with a lot of people who live near them, or they might share the same language. An outsider is someone who feels unwelcome in a place and they do not feel like they belong there, which goes back to the idea of that sense of belonging, why that place is important for human life. So people who are outsiders don't necessarily have to live outside the place. They may also live there, but they may have negative experience with the place or not share values or characteristics with the people who live there. And that's quite important. We're going to be looking at how someone can go from an insider to an outsider. So whereas an insider is someone who's normally familiar and who's someone who doesn't live there, an outsider may be someone who doesn't live there, but it might also be that they live there, however, they have had a negative experience. They People can change from feeling like insiders and outsiders. And the reason why changes can occur can either be personal factors or external factors. So a personal factor could be something like age. So for example, when you grow up from being a teenager, you may leave to go to university and therefore you may change where you feel attached to as a place where you call home. So for example, I went to Bristol University and I now have a really strong place attachment to Bristol. Age can also change as people become more connected there. So, for example, if you spend a long time there, if you've been a resident in an area for a long time, you may feel more connected there. Or a personal factor could be that if you are a new mother in an area, 
Therefore, you may feel more connected to your local area as you rely on maybe child services and you build up your connections there. A final personal factor which may change is, for example, if someone has recently changed their gender, they may feel more or less welcome in a place depending on, um, depending on that place. Whereas external changes to a place can also change how people interact and use the spaces. So for example, if there have been new housing developments, this may encourage a new flow of populations and new services. And this may mean that someone now feels disconnected with the place. So for example, if you've been living in an area a long time and then suddenly you have a new influx of people or gentrification, you may feel like an outsider, although you have been living there a really long time. So there are different factors, which means that people can change from being an insider to an outsider. And usually it's quite good to have a few examples up your sleeve to speak about it in exams. You can either refer to your local area or you could refer to a place. So, for example, if you talked about external changes, you could talk about Stratford, that new populations have moved in there. And therefore people may feel like outsiders if they were originally living there. Another example is, for example, the Windrush generation. When they first moved to London, there would have been lots of conflict and lots of racism. However, now Brixton, there is a really big Afro-Caribbean community and there is loads of celebrations and they are very much insiders to the local area. So have an idea, particularly with this idea of changing places, that these places do change and people's attachment to places also change. What I want to explore now is the idea of categories of place. So we can categorise place into a few different ideas. We can talk about near and far places and experienced places and also media places. And these also can link together. Near places which are located geographically close to where someone lives. It may be where everyday experiences take place. So it might be a school if you live nearby or a local community place that you go to. Far places, on the other hand, are places which are far away from us and the distant places. So far places are just places which are located physically far from us. Media places are places that people have not been to or they are experienced mainly through the media. This may be books, TV and film, the internet and the radio. Experience places are places where people spend time in, normally where people directly live or if they're visiting a person. There are a few links between near, far, media and experienced places. So near places, people have normally experienced them in their everyday, so these ones link. Far places are distant places and people may experience them through the media. So for example, if you are choosing to go on a holiday, you may look it up on the internet or you may watch a film about it and you may experience part of it. So those are how those link. However, these lines are blurring, particularly with the idea of globalisation. So the idea of globalisation can change how we connect to a place. So for example, we may experience many more places through the media as globalisation increases the amount of media available to us. And this is quite a good link with your other topic of globalisation. Globalisation increases the connection between people and places. The rise of the internet and technology means that people can feel connected to places they've never experienced, which are media places. And also far places can seem closer with globalisation. So the increased availability of cheap air travel gives people easier access to a range of places which are hundreds of miles away. However, they may only be a few hours by plane. And this links the idea of the shrinking world effect. For the shrinking world effect, it may have taken days or even weeks to send a letter to communicate with someone in a different country. Whereas now we could just instantly speak to someone and this makes far places seem closer. So you probably have relatives who live in different countries and it's really easy to pick up the phone or to text them and see how they're getting on. Whereas before, those far places would have seemed really far away because you wouldn't be able to have such easy contact. And then finally, in this section, we are going to talk about the factors contributing to the character places. So particularly, what are endogenous and exogenous factors which relate to the character place? So endogenous, these internal factors which shape a place's character. They can be physical, 
such as location, which we'll look at, but they can also be human, and please don't forget that. Then we also have exogenous factors, and these are external factors which shape a place. So these can be relationships to places or flows, and we'll go into them in some detail. Exogenous factors or external factors or external agencies is one thing which comes up a lot in the specification, so it's really good to kind of get our head around what external factors or forces are shaping a place, because we're going to come back to this again and again and again. So for endogenous factors, we have location, topography, physical geography, land use, built environment, infrastructure, demographic and economic characteristics. Now these are all linked in your specification, so make sure you please know all of them. So location is where the place is. If a place is well connected, they may have more access to technology and different cultures. Topography is the shape of the landscape. So mountainous areas create harsh conditions to live in, and so they may also have a low population density. Physical geography includes the drainage, geology, altitude and climate of a place. A place with fertile land might have more people living there. Land use, this is a human factor. So this is the human activity which occurs there. So it could be, is it agricultural? Is it industrial use? Is it residential or is there retail? So for example, if an area has lots of shops or services, it may encourage people to visit a place. Built environment and infrastructure. This includes the transport and communication lines. Again, this is a human factor. So if there's poor infrastructure, it may limit access. Demographic and economic characteristics includes who lives there and what they are like or what they do as a job. So for example, cities usually have a more youthful population and they might have a high cultural mix. So your exogenous factors are your relationships with other places. So these can be people, money, resources and ideas. It's how places are related to other places or connected to other places. So for example, if we consider people, places that have a lot of tourism can influence the character of places. There may be more land use and economic factors that are encouraging people to come and visit there. This can create employment for people. Another flow of people can be migration. So migration can influence the character of places. So for example, in the UK and London, we have a lot of people living here from many different cultures. Um, and this can mean there are different stores for different cultures and there might be different celebrations. And this changes our character of place. Flows of investment can also affect the character of place. For example, if you have investment into a regeneration project, this may change the population as it may encourage more people to live there and it also may increase the amount of money and services that are in the area and also improve the quality of environment. Resources and ideas, this could be new ideas from globalisation, it can be cultural ideas as well on how people live their life, it could be an influence that has happened to the area and this can change how people are connected to a place and also contributes to the character of place. Okay, so that is the first part of our mind map for changing places. This is all the nature and importance of place. So what I'd say is go and have a break and then afterwards, after you've grabbed a cup of tea or a break, then we will go through the next section, which is about changing places, relationship connections, meaning and representation. Hello and welcome back. So the next part um, of the specification, we are going to look at changing places, relationship, connection, meaning and representation. If we have a look first at relationship and connections, we need to understand how relationship and connections on people and place change demographic and cultural characteristics or economic change and social inequalities. Okay, so one thing I think is quite important when we're looking at the specification is to unpick the idea of characteristics. So often you get asked how places change characteristics and they either focus on demographic and cultural or economic and social inequality. So demographic characteristics. Demography is the study of statistics that illustrate changing populations. So demographic characteristics of place include qualities such as age, sex, family status, education level, income, occupation and race. They are all to do with who lives in the place. 
Cultural characteristics are the collection of behaviours and traditions of a group of people. So this might be language, traditions, belief, food, music and values. They are to do with how people live their lives in a place. Economic characteristics of place include income, employment rates, types of jobs people do. Simply, they link to work and money. And social inequality is the difference between groups of people in terms of their quality of life. It may be differences in opportunities and this can occur with healthcare, education and services. So you will need to have a particular focus on either demographic and cultural or economic and social inequality within your local place. But it's really good to know what they all mean because if a question asks you, describe the characteristics of this place, you know that you need to refer to either demographic, cultural, economic or social. So what we're going to look at next is we're going to look at how demographic, socio-economic and cultural characteristics of places are shaped by shifting flows of people, resources, money and investment and how this happens at different scales. So people, resources, money and investment should seem really similar to your exogenous factors. And these external factors are what are really important and this word external will keep coming up again and again. One flow of people could be migrants. So migrants come into a place can change the demographics. So often migrants might include younger people usually looking to find work. Migrants can also be internal migrants to a place, for example, rural to urban migration, or they can be external. Now this may change the demographics of a place as it may lower the average age of a place. Another example could be, particularly in the UK, elderly people move out to more seaside resorts to be near the coast or even to, for example, Spain to live in a nice environment and that may increase the average age, changing the demographics of a place. People can also change cultural characteristics of a place. For example, migrants might bring their culture with them. So, for example, when a large migrant population settles in an area, there also may be some new places of worship. For example, in East London, in Brick Lane, you can actually see evidence of cultural change as the street signs in Bengali and also you can find mosques there. Shifting flows of people can also change economic and social characteristics. For example, if we stick with the idea of migrants, there may be new services which are required over there which can um, change the amount of jobs that are available and also if you have flows of people, for example tourism, it, this may increase the service-based jobs in an area. So for example, there may be more shops or restaurants for the tourists. Flows of migrants can also change social inequalities as well. For example, social inequality may be reduced if the area becomes less deprived, but there also may be greater inequalities between places. This can be seen when there's flows of people, for example, if gentrification occurs and wealthier populations are moving into an area, and this may increase the gap between people who are living in the area meaning that there are some wealthy people, but then also higher levels of deprivation and the gap is greater. If we have a look at ideas and resources now, first of all, for demographic and cultural characteristics, actual population policies and ideas about demography can change an area. So for example, there might be a pronatalist or antenatalist policy changing the population media can also shape people's beliefs. For example, if there's a flow of ideas on climate change, this can influence people's values and attitudes, and this may change the food they eat or how they interact with the environment. Ideas and resources can also impact economic and social characteristics. So for example, the flow of resources into a place can generate income and jobs for people. So for example, if people are extracting raw materials or more resources, or manufacturing something, then such as Detroit with cars, then this can generate income. However, if the flow of resources is controlled by a transnational corporation, or if areas stop selling the goods, then there can be a decline in the amount of jobs available. The flow of ideas can also be restricted to different places. So for example, if you look at China's Great Firewall, they restrict the internet, so stopping the ideas to the population. And this could limit access to technology and also increase inequalities. 
Money and investment. Now this is quite an easy one to explain for you if you're in the exam. So first of all, if there is investment into an area, for example, regeneration, this can quite easily change the demographic of people. So for example, if there is a new housing development, this may encourage a different demographic to move in. This was seen with the Olympics with East Village. It can also change the cultural characteristics as the people who move in may have their own cultures and there may be services or shops which are built around those cultures. For economic and social characteristics as well, it's also really clearly shown with regeneration. So if the company or government invests into an area, the number of jobs will increase. So for example, the regeneration of Westfield with the Olympics created 12,000 jobs. There also was an increase in number of visitors and this supported local businesses. Investment into infrastructure can also make places more accessible for visitors and this can also reduce deprivation as people have a higher access to services. However, if investment is directed away from the place, there may be more deprivation and unemployment might increase. And then what we're going to talk about, the impacts of external forces operating at different scales from local to global. So when you look at an exam question, if it says external forces or shifting flows, we really want to think about what is happening from outside that place which is changing the place. And we can have it at different scales from local to global. So for example, international and global institutions are at your global scale, Just transnational corporations may also be global or international, government policies are more national, and then local, you can also have local groups or communities which are changing places. Now these all have the ability to impact your characteristics, so whether that's demographic, cultural, economic or social. And so I'm going to stick with the moment just the same colour code that I was using earlier, just so we can see how the changes are occurring. So for example, if we have a look at TNCs, the movement of TNCs from developed to developing countries, when TNCs offshore their factories in a process called deindustrialization. This, for example, happened in Detroit with the car industry. This can lead to a lot of unemployment. Now, unemployment is your economic characteristics. It may also lead to your wealthier people moving out, which may be a demographic change. And it can also lead to more social deprivation as people who, people who stay in the area may be living there with a lower access to services. This is a social inequality. So you can see here how TNCs, or this external force, has impacted demographic, economic and social characteristics of a place. Global institutions can also change the amount of money that is invested into a place and the social, economic and demographic characteristics. For example, the IMF or the World Bank can offer loans to countries to reduce poverty and increase development. So government policies they, the governments decide where to invest money, so for example, where to have big regeneration policies. So for example, the Olympics was chosen to be in Stratford, and Newham was one of the most deprived boroughs in London. Or they may have enterprise zones, for example, investment into Manchester, where the BBC has moved up to Manchester. This can increase the amount of jobs, reduce poverty in the area, and also change the demographics encouraging more people to live there. So you can see you've got economic changes, social, econo social inequality and also demographic changes. Government policies also are linked to migration. So for example, these may also influence your demographic and your cultures of the place. And then also your local scale, you may also have community groups. These can offer support for cultures, whether it is new migrants coming, on, coming in, or whether it may be support for people who are living in very deprived areas, for example, support with homeless people. And then our next point in the specification is how past and present connections within and beyond localities shape places and embed them in regional, national, international and global scales. So this is just simply how your place is connected in the past and also in the present. So if we have a look at past connections first. This simply means how a place is connected. So, for example, in the past, many places were connected by sea trade routes. For example, London had the Thames, and that's how it was connected to many other areas. This then led to urbanisation and cities becoming more well connected, and consequently, London becoming a world city. 
Now, if we look at connections today, it doesn't just have to be physical locations, so how they get there, but it also can be our internet connections or our social links to places. So, for example, there are areas which are financial and banking centres, that is also London for an example, but also somewhere like Bangalore is now a centre of IT in India. And then also we are connected through places, for example, trade blocks with the EU, although we're going through Brexit, that is how we are also connected to other places. And these connections shape development over time. But you can see that these connections can be, we've mostly talked about international and global connections, but they can also be local. So for example, how well is somewhere connected to London? That may increase rural to urban migration. So it's really important just to have a look at where is your place connected to and how does this connection shape the place? Now, I think now's quite a good time to talk about the idea of globalisation of place. Now, globalisation of place really links with the idea of the global connections we have with different places. For, so, for example, Doreen Massey's work is really interesting here. Now, she was quite a famous geography who wrote about the global sense of place and our connection to place. Doreen Massey looked at Kilburn High Road and said that from looking at it, you could see the different layers and different connections. So, for example, the shops showed one connection of place for different areas. Migrants walking down the street would show different connections, and you could see how a place was built up in layers over time. And I'll connect, and this is a really interesting way of looking at how places are connected with different areas and how that shapes demographic, cultural, economic, and social inequalities. And she's a really good geographer to reference if you are unpicking the idea of global sense of place. If we also look at globalization of place, we can see how it's impacting our towns today. So, for example, a clone town and also the idea of placelessness. So a clone town is when you have lots of investment from TNCs and your high streets become looking like all in the same place. So for example, you could go to one high street in London and it'd be very similar to a high street in Manchester or a town, so for example, Andover. And we could probably guess what those shops would be. You'd probably have H&M, Starbucks, Costa, New Look, Superdrug, Boots, and those, these kind of shops are taking over our high streets. And these companies have much more money and it means that some sh local shops lose their businesses. This can also lead to unemployment in those areas. And then also the idea of placenessness is the idea that you can go anywhere and it's not distinctly located to a place. So for example, if you go to a shopping mall in the Westfield, you could be in anywhere in the UK. There's not any defining features. And globalisation is often changing our high streets. Globalisation is also changing how we interact with them. So, for example, a lot less people are using the high street as people shop online. And this also is what is impacting our place through these present connections. OK, so that pretty much summarises the idea of relationship and connections. So what we're going to go on to next is we're going to look at meaning and representation. So if you want to have a break, go get another cup of tea or a biscuit, then come back and we will look at the next part. Okay, and welcome back. So now we are going to look at the next part of the specification, which is meaning and representation. And in this, we're actually going to do a mind map within our kind of mind map. Um, and we're just going to look at all the different parts of the specification. So how humans perceive and engage and form attachment to places, how external agencies, including government, corporate bodies and communities, attempt to influence place meanings, how places are represented in different forms and also the past and present processes of development, which is really similar to what we've just looked at with connections. OK, so if we first will start with place attachment. Now, we talked about this in the beginning when we looked at what does place mean and what is sense of place. Now, place attachment is the emotional bond between a person and a place. This can be subjective, whereas this is different to place perception. Place perception is how the place is perceived or how people view the place. Now, these all link to the following. So if you are attached to a place, you might identify with a place like we talked about at the beginning, that you might be from the same culture. And therefore, that is important for your sense of identity or sense of belonging. It may also change your perspective on a place. So how attached you are, you might have a positive perspective to a place. And your experiences will also be influenced through how you 
engage or have an attachment with the place. So for example, positive or negative experiences may change our place attachment. So your external agencies are government, corporate bodies and community or local groups. Now these should sound familiar because they are external agencies, they are the same as external forces. So whatever you think about external, make sure you're thinking about governments, corporate bodies or TNCs and local communities and therefore your different scales. Now these external agencies can all influence or create specific place meanings therefore shaping the actions of individuals, groups, businesses and institutions. So what these are basically saying is how do these external agencies all change the meaning of a place? And there's different ways in which they can do that through place marketing, re-imaging, rebranding and regeneration. Now place marketing is the branding and sales strategies applied to different places. So for example, tourism is advertised now for adventure tourism. And this is how that place is marketed to attract people to go there. Another place marketing example is the slogan which was used in Amsterdam, I Amsterdam, and that became a motto or a brand for the city. Reimaging changes negative experience of place. Places which may have a lot of deprivation or crime or environmental pollution, they try to dissociate the place with negative images to make a more positive perception. So Places that have been re-imaged in the UK are places which may have had a lot of deindustrialization, for example, East London, but also your seaside towns that went into deprivation. And so, for example, Brighton has had a new image recently um, where it attracts a lot of people and it is known for, for pride and for being a very cultural place. Rebranding is the idea of how a place is redeveloped and marketed so, it, it, so that it gains a new identity. So this can actually include re-imaging, place marketing and also regeneration. It's a kind of all-encompassing term which kind of talks about particularly how places have been changed through investment as well. So for example Stratford is a massive case study that people have used time and time again where there has been, where the place has been rebranded through the Olympics and through Westfield and the negative images of what Nguyen was like before have been dissociated from that so that it is now a well-known place, a place where there are lots of visitors that go there daily to visit Westfield and also the Olympic Park. So if we look at external agencies, these can all influence place meaning through the strategies which we've just talked about. Now they can either be a top-down approach, for example governments may have decisions on where they want to rebrand and corporate bodies may increase the amount of investment into the area providing new housing developments or it can be in a partnership approach where government and corporate bodies work with local groups or they can be in a more bottom-up approach where communities also try and influence place meanings for example in Lewisham local communities organise People's Day which is South East London's longest running free festival and this promotes local pride and sense of place. So these external agencies, act through place marketing, re-imaging and rebranding, can all shape the actions of individuals, groups and businesses. So they could change the demographics as new people move in. They could also increase or reduce unemployment, depending on what the scheme is. However, this can also lead to conflict. And it's quite important to think about what conflict is caused when place meanings are changed by external agencies. When place meanings are changed, there may be resistance to places and also not every group may want to have that change. And it's really important for you to think about the different stakeholders. Who is it positive for? Who is benefiting? And why it is a bit more complex than simply a regeneration happens, more jobs are created and then it's positive. Like you're an A-level, so you really need to be thinking about the complexities, what happens when places are changed. So now we're going to talk about how places can be represented, mainly how places are represented through formal and informal forms. So if we have a look at representation, we can actually split it up into quantitative, qualitative, primary, secondary, and then also formal and informal. So if we have a look at formal representations, you have statistics, so this can maybe census information, this is collected by the government every 10 years. Just bearing in mind, although it is numerical and quantitative, 
it can actually be subjective. So data can be subjective if you are the one who's picking which information you want to show. So just be aware of that. It is countrywide, so it can be used to compare lots of places over different spaces. You also have population data. This is collected with the census data, but also local authorities collect population data a bit more often than every 10 years. The IMD index of multiple deprivation is really useful for understanding places and particularly economic and social characteristics. Police UK can look at crime and can therefore tell us more about the characteristics as well. And cartography is another formal way of representing place. So maps can be used to compare over time and also kind of combining statistics and cartography. GIS is a really useful way of representing places where you can see statistical information on different maps. So you can really visually see statistics change over place. So formal representation can represent place quite well. However, they mainly tell us facts about the population, not about how it is for people to be living in that place. When we're considering informal representation, we can look at newspapers, photographs, songs, poems, textual sources, or if there's any tourist in tourist leaflets that we can see, TV and film, graffiti and art. So some of these are really useful for, for particularly understanding how people viewed the past and what place experience was like. So for example, photographs are relatively recent with TV and film, whereas art and poems and even songs, we can see what the place was like many years ago as people wrote about their place and wrote about their experiences. And this can obviously give us a view of how people perceive, engage and form attachment with places. And we can also see how those images can represent place and whether they are, whether they give a good representation or only represent a certain area. So for example, photographs is determined on what photo the person is taking it off. So we could just see a really nice view and you might not be able to see any pollution which might be in the back of the photograph. Or songs and poems might show a very positive place perception and that might just be the opinion from one person so it may be subjective. So it's really good for you to be researching your local places using both formal and informal representations of place and also knowing what the advantages and disadvantages of are the formal and informal ones. So for example formal are normally less subjective, they're normally more objective because they are numbers apart from as I said census can be subjective and then informal representations are normally very subjective however they can give a much clearer idea of how people have formed place attachment and how people view that place. And then one thing I just finally want to add about TV and film is that particularly recently today many places on TV and film can create a place perception. For example, TOWIE filmed in Essex, or Game of Thrones filmed in Croatia, Poldark filmed in Cornwall. These normally have a single view of a place and they may not show the diversity of a place. And that is very limited in the representation. However, these media places can also change how a place is perceived and interacted by people. So for example, Croatia has seen a lot of increase in tourism and that mainly is how it was represented through informal forms such as TV and film. And then finally, I just want to talk about how development shapes places and this really links with past and present connections which we talked about earlier. So the character of a place is normally determined by a mix of the connections and also the developments they've undergone in their history and also their present day. So for example, Sheffield is an example where there was industrialisation and there's also been deindustrialization and also now regeneration. So, so how the development has occurred will often change how we perceive place and also how we interact with place or how people form place attachments. Okay, so just before we finish this section, I just want to first of all clear up the idea of the difference between regeneration and gentrification. So regeneration and gentrification often come up when we learn about geography and particularly changing places. These key terms come up will come up again and again, although they aren't defined on the specification, so I just want to go through that with you. So regeneration is the physical improvement to a place, normally from investment from an external force. 
whereas gentrification is more about changing demographics, usually when a more wealthy demographic moves into an area. So the reason people often get this confused is because gentrification can be a consequence of regeneration. So for example, in Stratford, there was investment into housing and this increased the amount of wealthier residents that were moving into Stratford, changing the demographics. However, it isn't necessarily always a consequence of regeneration. So although they can be linked, they sometimes aren't always linked. Gentrification can occur when there has either been a changing perception of place or maybe transport links have changed. So for example, Peckham, there has been lots of gentrification as young professionals are moving in. Often they might be more wealthy, and this is also changing the demographics. Now the impacts of this is as a wealthier demographic moves in, house prices rise. Now, one of the impacts most students know about gentrification is that yes, this may force people out of their homes, particularly renters. This can cause a lot of conflict. However, sometimes we forget to consider that there actually can be some benefits of gentrification. So if someone has been living in a house and owns a home, they can actually benefit from a wealthier population moving in. So for example, if they do not sell their house and decide to stay in their house, their house can actually increase in price significantly Therefore, people who have been living in the area, even if they are not the more, more wealthy residents, but if they do have their own home, they can benefit from gentrification. So regeneration is slightly different from that. Regeneration is the investment into a place and the impacts can vary from job creation or job loss, demographic change and also environmental change. A lot of regeneration is focused on having a sustainable area. Therefore, both regeneration and gentrification can both have positives and negatives and also lead to conflict. I just wanted to pull this up, the difference between regeneration and gentrification, as it often comes up in exams, so it's really important that you do know the difference between the two. Okay, so that ends this section. So this section is all on meaning and representation, and then when we come back, if you want to have another quick break, we are going to look at our local and distant place studies. Okay, so now we're going to look at place studies. So you need a local place study, which is somewhere that's local to you, where you live, and also a contrasting place study. So yours are gonna be different from the ones that I have here. There are ones in textbooks that you can look at as well, but your teacher would have chosen one that they think is going to be relevant for you. So therefore, I'm gonna make this quite generic. I'm going to give you an example of ones that I have taught, but you can use these ideas on how I'm laying it out and you can fill it for your own case studies. So first of all, you need, to you need to know both about lived experience in the past and the present, and then either demographic and cultural characteristics or economic change and social inequalities. <laughs> now I actually get the students who I teach to look at both of them, but you may have just focused on one and that's completely fine because you will only get asked one in the exam. And then you also need to have a lot of resources that you've looked at, which we talked about before. So suitable sources, which are your formal and informal representations. Now, the whole thing about these place studies and the whole topic is you have learnt about changing places. So you need to know what the place was like, how it has changed, what the place is like now, and why has there been these changes? So what are the external forces? So I find it easiest to draw a timeline and to have a look at the different factors. The examiners want to know that you know the place well. So you need to be really clear on understanding your local and your distant place. I think it's easier to split it into two or three key factors or key external forces that have changed that place. Then you can kind of see it as a timeline. Otherwise, there's so much information, particularly when we're learning about our, our places and our local place, we know it quite well it's quite difficult to work out what to put into an exam question. So if you go through chronologically, thinking about what it was, what was the lived experience, what are the characteristics of place, whether you're talking about demographic or cultural characteristics, what has been the external force which has changed it, how has this changed lived experience, how has this changed characteristics, why did it change again? And then you can start to build up a picture of how the place has changed. 
So for example, if we set it out like this, we are looking at how a place has changed from past to present, what external forces are going to impact the place and how is it changing lived experience? And I swear this is probably the easiest way to break down your local place. Obviously you have to do the research on your local place first and you need to know how you found out the information, but this will really easily help you summarize it. So for example, I teach about Lusham and if we look back in the past around the 1880s, there was lots of business in Lewisham, there was lots of money generated, for example, Deptford High Street, there were many family businesses, for example, textile shops were very successful, it was quite well connected close to the town of London, and um, it was near the docks, so there was a lot of trade, and therefore you could say that it was quite a positive lived experience. Looking at Charles Booth's poverty map, which is really useful if you are studying a place in London, it was known as the Oxford Street of South London, and a wealthy, mainly white British demographic lived there in Deptford and the economy was really good. Um, remember for your characteristics you really need to focus in in detail and I would know your area really really well. This is just a quick summary so you need to go into much more detail than this. Um, make sure you are either talking about demographic and cultural or socio-economic inequalities. So you really need to think about why has lived experience changed? And how has also this changed the characteristics? So what, extent, what has happened to the place that has changed the place? So one thing that happened in Lewisham was there was government policies to remove housing. This changed the lived experience. There was new high-rise housing in, in Deptford and in Lewisham. And this actually led to a lot of conflict. Characteristics, um, many of the wealthier demographic moved out and it actually led to more deprivation. Another external force which changed our local place was in the 1960s, the Windrush migration. A lot of people moved to South London, Lewisham being one of them, and this actually changed lived experience. It made it much more diverse and there was lots, there's lots of positives. So now Lewisham is one of the most diverse places in the country and it also celebrates its diversity. However, there was conflict when people initially moved there. And of course, this has changed the demographics. And if you know statistics, if you've had population change, then that will really help you. Then finally, lived experience has changed through an external force by government investing in the DLR, which has connected Lewisham to the rest of London. Now, this has made better connections. This may have improved lived experience for some people. However, this has also led to tensions such as gentrification. And would this therefore would have changed the characteristics, so for example, there's a change in demographic as more young professionals move there. And this is how we can see how Lewisham has changed from the 1880s to the present because of these external forces. So really have an idea, see if you can summarise your local place study into kind of three stages where there's been change. I'm going to do exactly the same for my distant place now. The distant place that I teach is Blenau Festiniog. This is my favourite case study. And I think it's really good for changing places because it's quite simple and quite easy to learn. Um, but as I said, stick with the one that you've been taught. Blenau Festiniog is a small town in Wales um, that was particularly impacted from the mine, the investment into slate mining. So we have a look in the 1800s. Blenau Festiniog was had very limited connections. It was mainly a farming little village. Not many people lived there, and it was mainly Welsh speaking. In the 1800s, there was investment from the government into slate mining, and this dramatically changed the town, changing the lived experience and changing the characteristics. There was new infrastructure, so the there were new roads that were developed, and also there's a railway, and the town grew along this railway. In the night in the 1860s, the town gained its first church and school, and the population peaked in 1881 to 12,000 people. So you can see how the demographics of the place would have changed quite a bit, and also the lived experience people would have. It was in the early 19th century, Blenau Festiniog was referred to as the slate capital, and people were very proud of the heritage of mining slate in Blenau Festiniog. However, another external force that changed was the lack of investment from the government, and this occurred in the 1900s. This led to deindustrialization. Cheaper slate was now available from Spain, Germany, and China. This changed lived experience dramatically. The decline of industry led to a lot of unemployment. The town experienced economic decline, and this changed the experience of people living in Beleno as it was no longer a town of booming industry, but rather a declining town. 
This meant there was lots of unemployment and people, particularly the younger population, started to move out as there was a lack of job opportunities for their future. The population went into decline and the area became very deprived. The population actually went from 12,000 to 4,000 in this time. Then the final external force, which I have looked at for Blenheim Festiniog, in the millennium, there was 12 million pounds invested into the area from the EU Regeneration Fund. And this has contributed to change, changing lived experience and also changing characteristics of place. So the regeneration funds were used to boost tourism, Lots of jobs were created, but also the regeneration improved the physical appearance of the town. Local slate was used as sculptures and also trails and walkways have been used so people can enjoy the natural landscape. So this has re-imaged Blano into a tourist destination and they've also used the heritage of slate so people feel really proud. This um, the characteristics are still a small population, but there's lots of people who come to visit Blenheim, and there is a still a very much well-speaking community. And from looking and investigating Blenheim, you can see there's a really strong sense of place. A lot of people speak Welsh, and they're very proud of their history of being a slate mining town. This is also shown through songs and poems and artwork, which all encapsulates the lived experience of Blenheim. This is how I would summarise kind of your place studies by looking at a timeline of how they've changed but also bear in mind that you need to understand how you've researched your place and I'm just going to write down some a few things that you need to make sure that you can talk about with your local places so for example your location of place and the endogenous and exogenous factors which have contributed to the character of place, the connections your past and present this kind of links to your um, external forces which have also changed your place, how the lived experience have changed, which external forces have impacted on your place, qualitative research and quantitative research to understand your place. So that brings us to the end of our mind map for changing places. If you've got any questions, let me know. This will also be saved so you can download this. And if you've got any questions about changing places, then just please write them in the comment below.